Welcome to The Man from Macro, where we look at the latest data and developments in global financial markets. And once again, this week on the 17th of October, Tuesday, we're faced with the same issue that we've been seeing before, which is both equities and more importantly, yields continue to go higher. As we speak this morning, the US 10-year yield is approaching the most recent highs. And this is going to create a problem because those yields will continue to march higher until we hit a proper recession. Now, many people are seeing developed markets, particularly places like the US and the UK, in some ways like the new emerging markets, where the deficits, these big deficits that we have, are going to see yields basically going higher as yields get penalized or bonds get penalized and yields go higher as a response to this financing gap that these uh, regions and countries have. Now, what's really interesting, though, is that although we are seeing bonds being penalized, actually a lot of the assets, particularly in the US, are still benefiting from some form of exceptionalism. And we can see this in the ratio of the S&P versus the broad emerging markets. So a lot of people think emerging markets are doing well, but the S&P ratio versus the broad emerging market has recently been making a new multiple year high. And as you can see on this chart, in fact, this is a high that goes back to 2000. So this is before we saw the real takeoff of China. So the US equity market still looks on the surface like it's doing pretty well. We can also see the currency is doing well. Once again, when we look at the emerging market FX index, this is the broad based index. You can see that that's pretty much near its lows. So that's the emerging market FX underperforming the US dollar. And it feels that this is unlikely to change anytime soon because although we've seen this rollover in inflation measures, so we've got CPI in, in this chart, CPI, core CPI, all rolling over. Headline CPI has been bouncing back. And the Employment Cost Index, which is one of the Fed's favorite, is still relatively high around about that 4.5% level. The problem we have here is that it's easy in some ways to break back down from those high levels of inflation that we had, 9.1%, but it's a lot harder to get back to that 2% target. So we get that sort of stickiness as we approach the target, which means that the Fed could still have to be on the front foot in terms of dealing with inflation, particularly if it worries about inflation going into 2024. But Whilst we look at the equity market and it looks like it's performing well, in fact, the equity market in the US is nowhere near as strong as that headline index suggests. And this is all down to breadth. And this is the chart that I've, uh, I've taken from, I think it's Apollo, it was on Twitter. And it shows how the top seven stocks in the S&P are having that very, very dramatic impact on the performance of the S&P. If you look at 493 stocks, they've been flatlining. If you look at 500 stocks because of the seven stocks, these are the tech heavy type of names with all that cash. Those have been driving that performance. And when we break it down a little bit further and we look at the ratio of the banks versus the S&P, because the banks often give us a good clue to how the economy is doing and really how the, the real equity market is doing. Well, we can see that that ratio of the BKX index versus the S&P is at its multiple year lows. And in fact, what we've also noticed over the last, well, basically two decades, but generally the last decade, is that generally when the banks are underperforming, bad things are happening, which kind of makes common sense. But you can see that the banks have underperformed significantly through the last two recessions. And even if we go back to the dot-com bust of 2000, in the period where we actually had the recession, the bank's ratio versus the S&P did flatline during that recessionary period. And even in the period of the last 10 years, when we've seen things like a profits recession, generally the banks have been underperforming. So the banks underperforming today is a signal that all is not well. But it goes back to this big problem that we all have, which is we kind of know the pockets of difficulty within the US economy and the global economy. But what we've not had yet is this diffusion, i.e. across the whole economy. We've not had depth yet to a proper slowdown. And therefore, we've not had duration to any major pullback in GDP, with the last time we saw negative territory being back at the beginning of 2022. But we can also see that things are deteriorating in the credit space. Now, this is a little bit of a crowded trade, but HYG, which is the high yield ETF, that continues to be on the back foot. It continues to roll over. And yet, we're not seeing this happening throughout the whole economy. We're assuming it's going to happen, but it's not happened yet. Because as we can see in this next chart, net interest paid as a percentage of profits 
is still towards the record lows. This is because there is still a lag between what the Fed has done in raising rates and the impact that this actually has on many of the big corporates who are able to roll over their funding requirements well out into the future. So they're not yet being impacted by those interest rates. And this is where that problem lies. If we're looking for a recession to bring those yields down, well, we need all these things to coordinate together. Even in the mortgage market, when we look at mortgages and say, wow, they're at seven or eight percent. The problem with that is they are high if you want to move and you have to roll into a new mortgage. But for anybody who locked in their mortgage a few years ago, they're still at relatively low levels. So this is a problem for volumes in housing transactions, but it's not a problem for people who are in a house and don't want to move. And it's therefore very difficult to see how things roll over properly until we see everything become coordinated together in terms of a slowdown. But we are seeing these pockets, and this is that difference between the haves and the have nots. When we look at this, which is personal interest payments, and this is from the Game of Trades Twitter site, and you can see this incredible surge. And this is something that's also been repeated elsewhere. I, I think it's Larry McDonald showed these two charts, which show consumer US debt, um, and this is credit card loans, which have also been surging, as well as credit card interest rates, once again, all, also surging. Those who are indebted are suffering. It's the same in the corporate world. If you've got high levels of debt, you've got trouble. But if you've got a large cash pile and you've got almost no debt, then actually these high interest rates have been a benefit. And this is very much the case that we're seeing across the market. And it's one of the reasons why within the equity space, quality is doing relatively well. And quality generally means low levels of debt, high levels of cash, benefiting from those high interest rates. But if you've got high levels of debt, whether you're a corporate, a household, or a government, you are generally being penalized. And so this makes it very difficult for the economy and the market to see something which is going to be a kind of singularity, as it were, with everything coming together, which is kind of what you want if you want to see those yields rolling over. And unless we get that, it probably means that the Fed has to act harder. And therefore, the Fed is more likely to be on the front foot in terms of interest rates, whilst we see unemployment remaining relatively low, relatively tight, and the equity market continuing to perform well, even as these yields go higher. So one thing we've discussed before, and it's the final thing I'll say here, which is whenever you see the equity market rally and with the VIX, which is the volatility index below 20, and it's been one of the longest periods below 20 that we've seen over the last few years. Well, normally low volatility begets periods of higher volatility. So what we see is, is basically like that Minsky moment where things that are stable then suddenly reach that instability. Now, something that Imran Lacker of Options Insight has pointed out is that there are structural reasons why the VIX should be lower today. So you could argue because of structured products that today 20 is the new 30. So we should look at the VIX at the 15 to 20 level, and perhaps it is higher in reality than, than we actually think from that headline level. But until we see something change, it could be that volatility stays relatively subdued. And this gives us an opportunity. Because volatility is relatively subdued and because the equity market has rallied, anybody who has been long this market could easily roll out of those positions, i.e. lock in some of those profits, take that cash and buy longer dated calls. Those longer dated calls keep the skin in the game. If the market then rallies and continues rallying, you have some of that upside. Not all of it. You will underperform a rallying market, but it gives you something in play for the rest of this year and maybe into next year. And if we see some of the unemployment data being revised higher historically, and we start to feel that actually unemployment is starting to pick up, and we think that that equity market will roll over, which it always has done when unemployment has properly picked up, well, then you've got your cash on hand. You're basically in a safer position. You've got that exposure if the markets break away to the upside, but you've got your cash. So if the market then does roll over, you've got your ammo dry to be able to buy into that dip. We've mentioned this before, we continue to mention it. It is very, very hard to time. There's nothing wrong in saying that. It is very hard to call this market. It's been a very hard year and it continues to be hard because things are not being coordinated one way or the other. We're seeing pockets of strength, pockets of weakness, but nothing that's concerted and coordinated together. And therefore taking some cash off the table, putting it into a bank, so taking some money off the equity market, putting it into a bank, taking some of those interest rates on offer, as long as the bank is safe, all the same with the money market fund, giving yourself exposure through call options at the index level, but keeping your powder dry is a very good way to play out what is a very, very uncertain outlook for the next three to six months. And of course, please remember that all of this is for education and engagement purposes only. 
None of this is investment advice. It's just a few of the ideas that we're seeing through the market based on what's happening with the data at the moment. Yeah.